Maybe it is the profession that I'm in, but I see angry people everywhere, all the time. As a police officer, this is a paradox that I've been forced to confront. What is it that makes us so angry all the time? There's a spectrum of horror, rapes, lynchings, mob attacks. Where are we heading as a society? Have we ever thought about it? As an IPS officer, fresh into the service, I recollect with anguish and distress the rape threats faced by a junior college mate of mine back in 2016 for being the sister of one of the persons arrested by the police in Jawaharlal Nehru University in the wake of the JNU protests of 2016. I remember how she was told to go and live in Pakistan or be ready to get raped. While the hysteria eventually died down, what lingered in my mind was a bitter, unpleasant aftertaste of what a young Muslim female university student had to face with her gender, her nationality, and her religion being attacked in the most vulgar and reprehensible manner by persons who claim to have the best interests of the nation at heart. A peek at the Facebook page of any female celebrity would reveal cyberbullying at its extreme, with misogyny, objectification, crudeness, and the threat of sexual violence scattered across comments, with people almost competing to be more demeaning than the other. Back in 2016, in the aftermath of the Supreme Court verdict on the Kaveri water issue, it was a 22-year-old woman who single-handedly incited an angry mob that set 47 buses on fire, unleashing a mindless chain of violence in the city of Bangalore. I'm sure at least some of you would have seen videos of lynchings that have happened in our country. And the very thought of a lynching being videographed is itself so terrifying because it reflects what we are becoming as a society, where a hate crime is converted into a public spectacle. To cite another example, what is it that drives young, educated, middle-class professionals to drop everything and take up arms against the state or join terror outfits? In Kerala, which is the state from where I hail and I work in, there have been recent disturbing examples of young professionals leaving everything to go to countries like Syria and join banned organizations like the ISIS. Hannah Arendt, in her theoretical construct of banality of evil, underscored this everydayness of violence. And it is this ordinariness of violence, the subtle and subconscious levels to which it has seeped into our everyday lives that makes it so disturbing. The abhorrent must repel and anger us. It must repulse us. The minute it starts sliding past our consciousness, or the minute it starts failing to stir us, it means that we have gone wrong somewhere as a society. And that bodes bleak times ahead for us as a generation, as a society, and as a nation. Now, one might argue that violence has been an intrinsic, inevitable, inseparable part of human history. After all, the world has borne testimony to world wars, genocide, civil wars, and state-sponsored violence. So why the need to play up violence in this current context? And for many of us with our middle-class sensibilities, we may feel an utter disconnect with an issue like a local politician threatening Deepika Padukone with beheading or offering a reward of five crores to anyone who beheaded her. We may think that this is just the handiwork of a few fringe elements. And religious fundamentalism, why should the majority of us even bother about it? Today, I argue that violence is not merely gang wars, shootouts, arson, rioting, or looting. It is intolerance in our everyday thinking. It is an extreme reluctance to accept alternative currents of thought. It is misogyny. It is homophobia. It is regressive practices. It is unwarranted aggression. In other words, it encompasses our everyday thoughts words, and deeds. In fact, the threat of violence looming over individuals is far more frightening, as it not only inhibits the person concerned, but also represents a pervasive culture of violence where threats that affect one's life and dignity become a common diabolical tool to vent anger and to silence the other. It becomes a weapon, nameless and misdirected, to terrorize and taunt. Which brings me to the next question. What is it that draws seemingly ordinary people to violence? And what explains the extent to which 
violence has permeated our everyday lives. While the motivations and reasons, the politics, the psychology, the economics, and sociology behind these apparently disconnected events may be many and varied, today I seek to underscore the theme of violence and the role of the youth as participants, as perpetrators, and also as the demographic group most primely positioned to tackle this onslaught of violence. So why is the mask of civility slipping? Is it unemployment? Is it a failure of education? Is it uh, growing alienation and frustration? Is it patriarchy, the fundamental patriarchy of our communities? Or is it simply the availability of more platforms and spaces like social media where anonymity offers us the scope to get away with recklessness and vulgarity? In my opinion, it is a little bit of everything. Firstly, when youngsters no longer identify with the aims and objectives of the nation state, they may feel compelled to adopt parts of violence that are inherently self-destructive and anti-establishment and violent. Secondly, when youngsters feel that they have no more stake left in being compliant with accepted social mores, the risk of adopting parts of violence may appear far less riskier. And this is where the role of law enforcement agencies can play a very important role in convincing everyone that they must stay invested in the system no matter what. When youngsters lose faith in the ability of the establishment to uphold what they perceive as justice, it signifies a very dangerous trend at the beginning of the end. When social media platforms offer the scope for everyone to voice their opinion with practically no accountability, it is far too tempting to let the beast in us take over. Most cases of misogyny have at their root a misplaced sense of entitlement and privilege that many males carry and consider it a legitimate right when it comes to silencing outspoken women. And finally, it has been plausibly argued that violence can also be a result of cultural conditioning. It is not something innate to human beings, but it's something that can be culturally and socially taught and learned. So it may be our cultural conditioning that has to explain the recent attempts to silence voices of women's empowerment. Social media as a vehicle for the perpetration of violence has become extremely common now. Internet is used as a medium for the proliferation of terrorist-related ideology, for child pornography, prostitution, and drug peddling. A study conducted by McAfee in 2014 revealed that 50% of Indian youngsters have been exposed to cyberbullying at some point in their lives, either as victims or as witnesses, and 36% had been cyberbullied. Comments that are defamatory, unlawful, slanderous, hurtful, threatening, sexually or racially offensive, have threatened to take over the internet. And very recently, an example that all of, all of you would relate to, the blue whale challenge that took the lives of almost 200 youngsters all over the world. And it had a very, very sinister way of operating where each player would be assigned an administrator who would set a player a series of intense tasks to be completed over a period of 50 days, starting with self-harm and culminating in suicide. While thankfully, this absolute monstrosity of a challenge has been outlawed and banned, it still remains a reminder of the way the internet can wreck the lives of youngsters all over the world. Misogyny as a form of online violence has been, has been reflected in umpteen number of cases. And I once again go back to the state of Kerala, where a young actress, Parvati, recently expressed her views against the choice of role of a superstar in choosing to don the role of a police officer who threatened his senior lady police officer with sexual violence. For this perfectly frank comment, which to be very honest, reflected the sentiments of a majority of the women who had watched the movie, Parvati was incessantly attacked online by fans of the superstar who just could not digest that a lady and that to someone so junior in the film industry had dared to express her views on the choice of role of a megastar. While the takeaway from the whole episode was that heroes need to move away from the misogynistic alpha male garb and portray roles that reflect a more sensitive human being, I really wonder how many women would take the risk of saying this out aloud. 
In another recent instance, in a TEDx talk, actress Reema Kalingal, when talking about gender inequality in the film industry, was taunted and mocked online for using the example of how she as a child was denied fish fry at the dining table till all the men in the house were fed. Instead of trying to appreciate the larger point of entrenched female subservience that she was trying to make, men of all opinions and persuasions tore her apart. And I found it extremely ironical because it was this very sense of male entitlement that she was questioning. <coughs> Everyday sexism on the street, the misogynistic portrayal of women in the media, domestic abuse within families, slut shaming, the list of horrors that women have to face on a daily basis is long and depressing. It is high time we became sensitive to the violence that surrounds us, that threatens to desensitize us, and also carve out a space where we can vocalize our thoughts and have conversations about it. And this is where the Me Too campaign of 2017 acted as an eye-opener, where women from all across the globe came forward to share their experience of sexual harassment. It is actually a sign of better times to come, because at one point, men sexually harassed because they could. We have now reached a stage where women can finally talk about it. It has allowed us to look into a vice that had been socially accepted and that has insulted and humiliated millions of girls. Now you might wonder that isn't it rather paradoxical that a police officer is standing here on this platform and stating that violence and the tolerance for it is on the rise. However, it's only if we acknowledge that this issue runs deeper than being a mere law and order problem can we take the first steps towards building a more harmonious society. When I see distraught women victims of domestic violence, jilted lovers and estranged couples using social media to abuse and attack each other, or when I arrest college students for drug abuse or violent campus politics, I see this narrative of violence every day in my bread and butter. Suicide rates among youngsters are rising alarmingly, revealing an unsettling trend of self-directed violence. In this context, creating a counter-culture, a counter-narrative of violence is the only way forward. And of course, the state and law enforcement agencies, notably the police, need to step in to immediately establish rule of law when an act of violence is reported, and also insist that every suspicion or provocation is dealt with only by the criminal justice system and not by mob justice. The not in my name protests to protest against atrocities on minorities, the massive civil society uprising in the aftermath of the uh, Nirbhaya gang rape and murder in Delhi, or even the Pink Whale website, which was set up as a counter to the Blue Whale Challenge to showcase the ways in which the internet can be used to spread love, is an eye-opener and a sign that we are finally starting to stir. So what is the way forward? Civil society activism, social media etiquette, a relook at education and the values that we choose to uphold in our everyday lives. Analyzing our everyday actions in the light of progress versus regression. Committing ourselves to public discourse that is constructive and civil. Making social media a space for free voicing of opinion rather than a site for violence. Rethinking how we raise our children and contemplating on how our democratic institutions are going to weather this churning of society. The need of the hour is to take a conscientious stand against violence. Perpetrators of violence need to be brought to book under the laws of the land. And policing has to evolve to keep up with the increasing angst and restlessness among youngsters. As the cliche goes, winning hearts and minds is far more important than keeping peace with the barrel of the gun. As Nelson Mandela said, safety and security do not just happen. They are the result of public consensus and public investment. There's a lot of collective thought and effort that has to go into it. The time is ripe for us to rethink this culture of violence and whether it is a pebble thrown into the still waters of our consciousness or an ax that breaks the frozen sea within us, the time is ripe for, or for all of us to start rethinking violence. As citizens of the nation, that has given the world the greatest exponent of nonviolence that history has seen, Mahatma Gandhi. It is upon us to take a pledge 
to build a more to build a more peaceful society a less belligerent society because if not now then when if not you then who thank you